Amen. All right. The title of the sermon this morning is Raising Godly Children. Raising Godly Children. I'm going to be giving you biblical principles from the Bible, of course, on raising godly children. I want you to look with me at Proverbs chapter number 2, verse number 6. The Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I want you to turn in the book of Proverbs to chapter number 13. Proverbs chapter number 13. Now the Christian life has many different tasks. There's many different aspects and things that we are responsible to do and to commit in our lives as Christians. And one of the most difficult tasks is raising children. It's one of the things that oftentimes is avoided and ignored. We focus on soul winning. We focus on reading our Bible. We focus on prayer. We focus on all these different things. We even focus oftentimes on our marriage very much so, which all of these things we should right, rightfully have attention towards. One thing, though, I've noticed that is neglected more so than, than any of these things, and it's definitely put down towards the bottom of the list, is raising our children. And I believe that there's a lot less emphasis on and the importance on raising our children in Bible-believing, independent Baptist churches than there ought to to be. You know, if you stop and you think about the importance of getting a convert when you're out soul winning, and I know I've used this example before, but it's very important. I believe it, it delivers the point very well. We're all seeking of just out there to get a convert, aren't we? We want to get that, that person saved, and then furthermore, we want to get them into church so we can start, we can start teaching them the Word of God, right? How many, how many uh, uh, fathers or mothers in this home preached the gospel to their children and got their children saved, right? Plenty, right? Many of us have given the gospel to our children. We've gotten them saved. They're, this church is filled with exactly what most people are looking for. And they're fresh. They're raw. They, they haven't been corrupted by the world. They don't have these horrible things in their minds. But you know what? We oftentimes overlook that. That, that they are in a better position oftentimes. Our children are in a better position to serve God than the people out in the world. Not downplaying the importance of getting a convert and getting someone in church. That's amazing. And praise God for that. But we are set up perfectly. This is the ideal example with all the children that we have and we possess. And we need to start taking that particular responsibility that we are given from God a lot more serious than we already do. I'm going to be giving you different principles uh, uh, throughout the Bible on raising godly children. Raising godly children. Now the very first one is one that is oftentimes ignored. Maybe not in our churches. It's looked down upon. It is, it is uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, you are demonized if you do so. And that is spanking. The importance of corporal punishment. Of spanking our children. This is a commandment from God. And if a parent does not spank their children, they're disobedient to God's word. Number one, in, in order to have godly children, to raise godly children, you must be spanking your children. Look with me at Proverbs chapter number 13, verse number 24. The Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now this is total, totally opposite or juxtaposed to what the world would say today because we now even in the United States of America was founded as a Christian nation, Christian morals, people have moved so far away from the concept and the importance of spanking your children to where people even, even would, would, would demonize you and look down upon you if you do not spank your children. And oftentimes what do they say? They say that's child abuse. They say you're abusing your children. Well the Bible says... According to the Bible, that if you are not spanking your children, that you hate your child. Right. That you're not showing love to your child. That you are not... Because you know why? Because the only way to truly instill into their hearts... Time, let me just break this to you. Timeouts don't work. Okay? Timeouts don't work. Writing sentences do not work. Putting them in the corner does not work. There is an element. And, and you know what? A lot of people will not like this. But in order to get someone to have discipline, in order to get someone to be obedient, there has to be an element of fear. That is the only way. Do you know why you stop at a stoplight? Do you know the reason why? Two reasons. Number one, you're afraid to get a ticket. And number two, you're afraid that a car is going to blow through there and, and kill you. That's why. There's an element of fear there. And do you know the importance of spanking your children and there being corporal punishment is number one, it shows them who the boss is. 
You know what else it is? It's meant to instill fear into their hearts. Now, we're not talking about abusing your children, just beating them until they're just completely black and blue. Of course not. We're talking about a parent, cool, calm, collected, who loves his child, bends them over their knee, just like how we did, you know, in the ages of old in the United States of America, the parents who loved their children had good morals. They would sit them down. If they broke one of the, the rules of the household, they would bend them over their knee and they would give them a few swats on their rear end. Why? Because they love them. And you know what it does? Is it instills fear in them. And you know what they do? They think, I don't want to get another spanking again. They don't care about the sentences. They don't care about the, I can tell you from personal experience. They don't care about the timeouts. But do you know what does work? Spankings. You know why? Because God, you know how I know that? Because God says so. Because I believe the Bible. And you know what? There's plenty of examples that you can, you can use to show that. Uh, I want you to look with me again at Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter number 19. Proverbs chapter number 19. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 19. We'll look at a few other examples here. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 19. Verse number 18. The Bible says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. And let not thy soul spare for his crying. So here we see another example. What is chasten? It's referring to spanking, right? And the Bible uses the word beat, but we would today, it's a little bit different today, we would say spank. That's what we would refer to as. And that's what it's referring to here when it says to chasten. It's talking about spanking your son, disciplining your son. I want you to notice though that it says chasten thy son, and then look at those next four words. While there is hope. What does that imply? That implies if you do not spank your child, if you do not chasten your son, that there will come a time where there is no longer hope. Then it goes on and says this, And let not thy soul spare for his crying. Now there's a few different ways in which a, a, a child can get to a, a state in his life where there is no hope. Now, number one, the most extreme example is if a child's just not even saved and he goes down this just horrible road of depravity and just becomes a hater of God and becomes a reprobate. Obviously, in that case, and children can become, you know, the Bible talks about cursed children. Children can go all the way to the point of just being a complete, full-blown hater of God and a reprobate. That is very possible. Number two, though, which is going to be much more applicable to us, is just that we could just raise a very rebellious son, a very rebellious daughter, a very rebellious child. And if you allow that to continue in their lives, you allow them to continue in sin and continue just doing whatever they want and living this life of just you know, indulgence and, and this life of just, just doing whatever they want to do and, and just having no respect of authority, there will come a time when they are so hardened there will come a time when they are so stiff-necked that they're not even interested any longer and that there's nothing that you can do. And obviously, you know, how, how sad would that be as a parent just knowing that there's really, at this point, there's nothing that I can do as a parent. There's nothing that I'm going to be able to do. It says, while there is hope. Then it goes on to, and it says, and I want to exposit that, it says, let not thy soul spare for his crime. Do you know what oftentimes parents want to do with their children. I do this all the time. All the time. I want to show my children mercy in almost every situation when they, when they sin. I'm, you know, I'm sure parents feel that way, of course. You know, there, there's many times when my parent, when my, I'm sorry, when my, my children will break my rules and I just want to give them mercy all the time. I just want to show them grace all the time. But that's not good for them. You know, you think that you're helping them, and that's the attitude that the world has when they say, hey, you know, you hate your children if you spank them. No, that's not true, because what actually helps them? What actually benefits them? What is actually good for them? What is it that's actually good for the child in the long run? It's giving them the spanking. Now, they may break your rules, and, you know, they may come to you, and oftentimes, what do they do? Notice it says, and let not thy soul spare for his crime. What do they do when they come to you? Sometimes they just beg you, don't they? I'm sure every parent knows that the oftentimes when they will do something wrong, they come to you, and I know they do this to my wife much more than they do to me because they know that they can get away with more with her. And if I'm like in the other room, I hear it going all the time. No, mama, just be Jeremiah. He loves that. He, all the, he calls her mommy all the time, but when he's about to get a spank and all of a sudden it reverts to mama. You know, he's like, no mama, no mama, no mama. I, and I always oftentimes, I'll add an additional spanking on four of the back talking for that. 
But you know what? You know what they know? They know that they can, they can you know, play the sympathy card. They get scared also and they just start screaming out. But let me ask you this. What's good for them? Is it good just to say, okay, son, I love you? Is it good just to kind of cave and to, and to, and to break? What, what is best for them? Is it best just to, you know, just to allow them to get away with every single transgression because you love them? Is that what's best? Well, you're not truly showing love to them. It's easy as parents, because we love our children, you know, to, to look at them and to think, well, I, I don't want to spank them. You know, I don't want, because obviously, you know, a spanking hurts. No one enjoys it. For the present time, it's grievous, like it says in Hebrews 12, right? It's not joyous, it's grievous. So, who enjoys seeing their children being in grief? No one, right? No one does. So, you know, it's very easy. That's why the Bible tells you, let not thy soul spare for his crying. You know what it's, it's easy to do? It's very easy to back away from, you know, spanking very slowly. It's very easy to just start making exceptions all the time. It's very easy just to allow them to get away with it here, allow them to get away with it there. Why? Because we don't like seeing our children in grief, do we? But let me ask you the question, what is good for them? What is, what is best for them? Is it, what type of child would your children end up being if you just allowed them every time? Every time that you had, you know, you, you just felt, you know, uh, uh, sympathy for them when they had committed a transgression and they came to you every single time and they just cried out to you. You know, please, mom, what kind of kid would they end up being in the long run if every time you just gave them a pass? You think they'd end up being a good kid? No, they'd end up being a monster. They'd end up being a terrible little brat is what they would end up being. You know, so what is best for them is what we need to, we need to have their best interest in heart. And as God commands, spanking is uh, uh, the correct method of discipline. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter number 23. Look with me also at Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23 Look with me at verse number 13. It tells us, With, Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now I want you to look again at verse number 13. So notice how, how common this is. And I know that parents can relate to this. Notice again how it's trying to... It's trying to convince or compel the parent that doesn't want to spank his child or, or her that doesn't want to spank her child. It says, withhold not correction from the child. Who's it speaking to? It's speaking to someone who wants to do what? To withhold the correction. Who wants to have mercy every time that their child uh, you know, commits a transgression. It says, withhold not correction from the child. And then it explains, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. What's it saying? You're not going to kill him if you just spank him. You're not going to kill him if you just give him a whipping on the butt. When he's, when he's screaming out and yelling like he's dying, he's not really dying. When he's screaming out and throwing a fit and all of that, he's not really dying. It's just a spanking. That's what God is trying to say. He's expressing the importance of disciplining corporal punishment to your children, but then he's also letting you know and reassuring you, hey, it's not that bad. That's the point of that statement. It's not that bad. And then he goes on in verse number 14. This is a commandment. It is a commandment to Christians to spank their children. It says, Thou shalt beat him with the rod. Amen. That is a commandment to spank your children. And if a Christian says, Hey, you know, I just don't like spanking my children. I just don't spank my children. You're disobedient to God. You are just as much disobedient to God, according to Proverbs 23, 14, as you are to any of the commandments in Exodus 20, with the Ten Commandments. What do the Ten Commandments say? Thou shalt not, right? They prohibit certain things. Thou shalt not, you know, make unto thee any graven image. You know, and then it goes through, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I mean, there's, there's multiple of them. You know, it's, it's a commandment. It's an imperative statement. Thou shalt. Thou shalt. And in this case, it's thou shalt beat him with the rod. It is a commandment to spank your children from God. It is a commandment. Now why? Why, did God, why does God give us any commands? What's the purpose? Is it just because he's a stick in the mud? Is it just because, you know, he's just oppressive and all of that? No, God's laws are practical. 
God's laws are for us, and if you abide by them, you'll be happy. The man that lives in fornication may think, hey, I'm having fun, but you're destroying your life. The, the, the man that goes out and commits adultery may think, hey, this is a blast. You're destroying your life. And ultimately, your life and everything around you will come to ruins. Now, let me, I'm going to tell you this about your children as well. If you do not spank your children... You're, you will destroy your children. Just like if you, you, know, you decide not to listen to God in any other area of your life, if you're not spanking your children, you're destroying your children. That's why the Bible says you hate your kids. You may inwardly love your children, but really what you are expressing to them and showing to them is hatred. Because you are doing something that is very damaging to your kids. There is something that a spanking does for a child that no other method of discipline can do. It's not like sitting in time out. You know, what child have you ever seen that has never been spanked in their life, grew up and was a greatly behaved children? Because I can attest to you, I grew up in an independent fundamental Baptist home. But I went to public school a lot too, for many years. And I can tell you this, that all, all, I can't think of a single exception. Some of them maybe went wayward for a few years and came back. But even their, their you know, way of wayward was not the same at all. Everyone virtually that I went to school with that was in public schools that did not have serious discipline, that sitting, you know, they just had timeouts or sitting in the corner and all that, they were all rebellious punks to their parents. They were all, all of them were, were, were rude to their parents and they would disobey their parents, at least behind their backs. You know, they were, they were not well behaved children. And you know, the exception proves the rule. Maybe there's a few here and there. That's why I said virtually all of them. But I will say this, I can't think of an exception of children that were spanked that are disobedient and rebellious kids today. I can't think of one, of one. And I grew up, I knew multiple, you know, different uh, 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 children from multiple different churches, IFBs, all of them. And, and yeah, maybe some of them went wayward and things like that. But you know what they, they, they did? They, they, for many portions, of their, almost all of their life, they were very obedient to their parents at least, and even when they became older, they were very disciplined human beings. A spanking does something. What it does is when you, when you discipline your children, when you discipline them, what it's doing is it's building self-discipline. It's introducing them to discipline in general, to being a disciplined human being. It's a commandment to spank your children. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs chapter 22, 15, I'll read this to you as well. It says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. That is a strong statement. Foolishness is, it says bound, bound in the heart of a child. It's saying like it's stuck, like it's stuck there. When children, when, 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 when we're born and we're growing up, there is no exception to this at all. Children are foolish. Children are foolish. And not just in the, sen in the sense, this is not just speaking about just being stupid. This is referring to and implying the sinful nature of children. It's not just talking about them just being dumb, just being ignorant. That's not all that this is speaking about. Do we just spank our children for just being stupid? For just saying something dumb? That's not why we discipline our kids. If our kids just say something dumb that's not necessarily wrong, like if they get an answer wrong, if you ask them something, do you just spank them? Of course not. When it's talking about foolishness, and oftentimes it's talking about being a fool, it's talking about doing something that's sinful. Doing something that is wrong and sinful. When it says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, it's talking about the sinful nature that, that all of us as human beings have. And children, as, as, when, when, when they were kids, when they were young... They just, they, all of them, without exception, they have this sinful nature just like t intensify. And when you get older, you have to, you know, you have to work very hard to try to be a better person. Notice afterwards, uh, you know, it explains that it's bound in their heart. It says, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Notice it says, drive it. Remember, it's bound in there. It's stuck in there. Does it sound like, number one, does it sound like this is something that's going to happen in just one, one, you know, sitting down, one session of sitting down and spanking your child? Of course not. It's something that is going to take a period of time, right? It's something that is going to, that's going to happen over a range of a certain amount of time, right? 
Not only that, does it sound like it's something that's just going to be just a, just, a, just a tap on the rear end? Now, as I said, I'm not talking about just beating your children until they're just completely black and blue and bleeding. Of course not. But does it sound like it's just something that's just a tap on the rear end? No, it says drive it. The purpose, obviously, is to inflict pain. That's the purpose. There needs to be a stinging aspect to the spanking. It's not something that's meant to be enjoyable. Right? When I got spanked as a kid, my dad didn't beat me. But you know what he did? He spanked me. Beat me, abused me by, you know, the world's, you know, uh, uh, not the Bible's, you know, terms, but the world's terms. He would bend me over his knee, he'd pull out his belt, and he'd give me a, a few lashes on the rear end. And it's not enjoyable. I didn't enjoy it. It hurt. It stung. You know? It was not enjoyable. You know what he was doing? I had foolishness in my heart, and he was driving it far from me. He was driving it out of me. And now I want to go to Proverbs. Go back to Proverbs. Actually, we're here. We're here. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15. I want to, I want to uh, further exposit on, on this from a different aspect. I want to point out all children. And this is very important. All children. Foolishness is bound, watch this, in the heart of a child. You know what that means? Pick one. That's what that means. It's speaking in generalities. It's saying pick one. Foolishness is, is bound in the heart of a child but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Each and every single child has foolishness bound in their heart. There is no exceptions. Every single child. It doesn't matter. You can bring me a child and I can promise you that child has foolishness bound in his heart. Every one of them. There's no exceptions to this. So all of our children, if we look at all of our kids, some may, may be better behaved than others, but foolishness is bound in their heart. There is a sinful nature that is there that is present in all of the children that are sitting in this auditorium right now, that are sitting in this, this church building. Every last one of them have a sinful nature and foolishness bound in their heart. There is no exceptions. There's not like just a couple of your kids and then, then your, your two favorites. You know, they, they don't have foolishness in their heart. Every last one of them. Every last child. And there aren't any exceptions like... You know, my children don't have foolishness. Like, your family's not the only one that's excluded from this. It's not just like, you know, there's two families here or one family here and foolishness is bound in their heart. Every single child, every child has foolishness in their heart. And this is the attitude that a lot of parents will have. This is very, very common. It's, it, it, it's funny when people, you know, you even, people will even like, like make spoof statements about this. About people just thinking that, it's, that, it's, that all other kids are bad but their kids, Right? You know, this is very common for a parent to do this because we love our kids. It's natural for, for parents to feel this way that, you know, that their kids are the only ones that are super well behaved. Their kids are the only ones that don't have any problems or their kids are just superb but everybody else's kids are bad. All kids have foolishness bound in their heart. All of them. Every last one of them. Your kids, my kids, all of your kids. All of my kids. Foolishness is bound in their heart. Your children have a proclivity to sin. Your children have the desire deep down inside of them to commit transgression. Your children have the desire to disobey you. Your children have the desire to lie to you. Your children have the desire to do that which is off bounds and out of limits and there are things that they're not supposed to do. Just you know, they have this inclination that is inside of them, as all of us do, because we're all sinners. All of us. Now, yes, I agree with you that some kids may be a little bit better behaved than others, but that sinful nature is there in every single one of them. In all of your children. You're going to probably, you could probably put your kids in an order and say, hey, you know, this kid's a little bit more foolish than this child, and this child's a little bit more foolish than that. But let me guarantee you that all of them have a sinful nature, and all of them have that desire, and all of them have a, an inclination and oftentimes to disobey you and to do bad things to you. And the person, the parent that thinks like, you know, like my kids aren't like that. My kids are different though, but my kids actually are different. Every parent, it seems like, says that and thinks that. You're the, you, every child wants you as their parent if you think that. Do you know why? Because it, and it's super, super dangerous. It's the same concept. Therefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Do you know why a child would want you as their parent? Because you're gullible. And because you're naive. That is, a, a child would love to have a parent that would think that, hey, I'm good. 
You know, and I'll never disobey you. I'll never do anything wrong. I'm never, you know, I'm unlike every other, you know, uh, child that, you, that, that, that there are. I'm, you know, just this perfect child, right? Every child would love to have a parent that does that because, because children seek to deceive their parents just by nature. Let me ask you, is there a single person that is in this auditorium when you were a child, did you just never try to deceive your parents? Did you just, were you just always perfectly obedient, always doing everything that your parents wanted you to do? Did you go, did you not go around and do things behind their back and not try to, and not, lo, you know, look at them and promise to them and tell them, I love you, I would never do that. Or would you look me in the face and say, I never did that. But you think that your kids are different? It's the same. It's, with, it's the same with all human beings that live. It's the same with everyone. The same way that you deceived your parents and the same rotten things that you did to your parents, your kids want to do that to you. Whether you notice it, whether, you are, you know, whether you're oblivious to it, whether you, whether you are aware of it or not, they want to do those things to you. And when they grow up and they get older, because none of us hardly have teenagers, and none of us have teenagers in here. My daughter's almost a teenager, but besides that, none of us have teenagers. The older they get, that doesn't go away. That sinful nature intensifies. Let me repeat that. The older they get, that it does not go away. The sinful nature intensifies. That is a fact. And there are other new things that they get interested in. There are other new things. They become more exposed to sin. Obviously, we can protect our children throughout their lives to a degree, but they're going to become more exposed as time goes on to different sins. And do you know what, you know, it's not like they just see these sins and then they're, all of them are just like not interested. Do you think that that's what your kids do? Do you honestly think that that's what your kids do? That they're exposed to some sort of sins and they're just like, that's horrible. Never want to see that ever again. With all sin that they're ever going to be exposed to, that's a joke. Is that what you did? Is that what I did? Is that what anyone does? No, it's not. And it's very, very important because the parents that oftentimes fail at parenting are the parents that think that their kids have some other type of, you know, uh, 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 just, just special endowment unto them. And they're just, they're gifted and they're totally different and they're just, you know, they're not susceptible to all the things that all other kids are susceptible to. And then, and, and then on top of that, those same kids will be, will be given special treatment by their parents. And then it's just making them more rotten as time goes on. It makes them more rotten. They're not, if they're not getting spanked, if they're just being allowed to do whatever they want, they're giving all this special treatment. And then their, their parents have this attitude towards them all the time, like, hey, there's nothing wrong with my kids. You know, this is the proclivity oftentimes for parents even. For, for us as parents. And we need to fight this. This is an inclination because we love our children. We can also, we can oftentimes look at our children in such a way uh, where we would do this. Every child has these same tendencies. And it starts young. Three, four, five years old. I'll tell you a story about Jeremiah yesterday. Super funny story. You know, it's, it's, it's not good, but because he's so young, we can laugh about it right now. You know, I'm pretty strict at the dinner table, okay? So if mommy puts something on your plate, you're eating it. Like, no exceptions. You're eating it. No exceptions. My kids, we sat one time with Michaela. This goes way back. We sat one time with Michaela when she was five years old at uh, this, this, this little breakfast place in Newport. And we were, we, she was eating eggs. And I'm talking, we're in a restaurant. And she's like, ugh, ugh, ugh. And you may think, man, it's way overboard. She, Michaela, do you like eggs now? She loves them. Loves eggs now. I made her do that a couple of times. She loves eggs. She requests eggs all the time now. You know, we did the same thing with Michaela with, uh, uh, with broccoli at Olive Garden. You know, most of the time it takes place at our house, okay? But if mommy puts something on your plate, you're eating it. Jeremiah used to not be a picky eater at all. Like, he would just eat anything. And then I don't know what happened. This, like, switch went off where the kid, like, anything that's green, any type of vegetable, he's just like... I don't, I don't want that. Oh, he like won't look at it. He just acts ridiculous about it. I don't know what happened. You know, if one of the other kids influenced him, but he used to just eat anything and not even think about it. Well, yesterday we had asparagus for dinner. And, you know, uh, of course, you know, he's got his asparagus. He only has two. Yeah, they're longer. I realize that. But two pieces of asparagus. 
Each of them had two pieces of asparagus, and Michaela likes everything, but she didn't even like the asparagus. I don't know what her problem is. Johnny loved it. Wait, I think he acted like he liked it to please me, but yeah, either way, Elijah ate his, even though it took him, you know, like two hours. And Jeremiah's over here, and he is struggling to eat his asparagus. I'm talking more so than any other thing. Peas, green beans, whatever it is. He is struggling. He puked one time, and, you know, he had to throw it, throw it up, and then I told him, get another piece of asparagus. So he's eating his asparagus, and I'm done. So I walk in the other room, and I'm sitting down and talking to Jessica and everything, but I'm still, like, maintaining the kids, like, are you guys eating still? Jeremiah's like, I'm almost done. Well, he gets up, and I'm, luckily, Michaela, you know, you know, probably not for the right reasons, but she's like, I think he put it in his pocket. And he didn't even put it in his pocket. He's got these shorts on, and he's got his hands up his shorts, where his shorts are, like, hanging like this. And he's like, no, I didn't. And I'm like, Jeremiah, come over here. He's like, no. I, and he's the one telling me no. He was saying, like, no, he didn't. He's like, no, I didn't. And he, like, walks over to me. I was like, let me see it. Listen to this. He's like, let me see it. And he pulls it out. And he's got this look where his eyes just get huge. Where he's like, I'm busted. Oh, no. Like, a look of fear. And he's like, he's like, Daddy, no, I wasn't hiding it. He's like, I just wanted to save it for later because it's so good. Like, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> this is all children. He's not even five years old yet. And I'm like, Jeremiah, you wanted to save it for later because it's so good? Why were you puking in there just a minute ago, buddy? Yeah, and he's like, he's like I, I, I did, Daddy. I did. I did. Of course, he got a spanking for lying and everything, and then he had to eat. I gave him an extra piece of asparagus. You know, but the point is that even at a young age, where does it come from? Just a young age, what do children desire to do? They desire to deceive you when they can. They desire to lie to you when they can. This is all children. This is, you know, maybe my child's maybe a little bit more special than, than some other children, but this is every single child, all of them. Without exception, all children have this desire to lie to you. They have this desire to deceive you. They have this desire to do bad things. Just like you did when you were a child. It's, your children are not exception. And oftentimes when parents get this attitude, that, that will not happen with my kids. My kids won't do that. You are setting yourself up for failure as a parent. You are setting yourself up for failure as a parent. And you know what you're going to do oftentimes is your, your children, you're making it easier for your children to get away with bad things. You're making it easier for your children to deceive you. You're making it easier for them just to continue down this path. And you know what happens? You're kind of blindfolded. And then when you take the blindfold off, when they're 15, 16, maybe 12, 13, however old, you're going to be in for a shock and your world is going to come falling down. You know, all of it's been going on all along behind your back and you were just totally oblivious to it. You need to already just know and understand and face the facts that your children are no, child are no different than any other children. Your children are no different than the public school kids. Your children are no different in the sense that they have the same desires to do all the same bad things. And if they had the opportunity, your kids would do it too. Your kids would be committing the same things. It's not like, oh, if I put my kids in public school, it wouldn't matter. No, they would, they would do all of the same bad things. Because they have that innate, you know, sinful, just inherent desire that we all have to commit sin. Point number three is even more crucial than spanking. And I don't oftentimes hear this, but this is even more crucial than spanking, is teaching them the Bible, teaching them God's Word. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verse number 7. Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verse number 7. You know what has more power than a spanking? Independent Baptists, they'll scream and yell, spank your kids, and hey, amen, spank your children. It's important, but you know what's even more important? Is teaching your, your children the Word of God. Because it has a lot more power than our wooden spoon does. God's Word is a lot more, is a lot stronger, and if you get that down in their heart, that's going to work even better than a spanking. Now, I'm not saying, hey, omit the spanking and just teach them God's Word. I'm saying God's Word needs to be there with the spanking, and it needs to be working in tandem together with one another. And I want you to understand and know that if one was the priority over the other, it's God's Word. The way that you know to spank is from God's Word. Think about that. Everything that we have comes from God's Word. The most important thing in your child's life to make sure that they grow up to be a godly child is teaching them God's Word. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 6, 
Verse, look at verse number 7. It says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Notice, diligently. You need to be taking time. You need to be making sure that they understand. You need to be making sure that they're interested. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down. And when thou risest up. Do you know what that's saying? You need to be talking to your children about the Bible all the time. Do you do that? You need to be speaking to your children all day. What does it mean when it says diligently? And then it goes on and says, Talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. What does that mean? From morning to evening. That's what that means. It means every activity that you're doing throughout the day, incorporate God's Word. Teach them God's Word. We need to be teaching our children the Word of God. We need to be doing it diligently. This needs to be something that we take serious and that it's very important in our lives. We need to be making sure that our children understand the Word of God. It's more important than a spanking. But we need both, of course. But this needs to take precedence. Make sure that you're teaching your children constantly the Word of God. Make sure that you're taking them aside. Make sure you're trying to apply applications. It's even good for you. you know, as the teacher, you, you learn things better. You look at things in a different way. You, may, may, you understand things a little bit you know, clearer and more detailed. When you have to teach something, you have to break it down in a very understandable way. So you know something you can't do when you teach? You can't teach something that you don't understand. Because there's going to be a question in a minute. You start spitting out just information and facts, just, just data without any understanding, they're going to be like, especially a child, because they try to understand things, they're going to be like, well, what does that mean? Do you know what you're going to actually have to do? Understand the Word of God. So it's good for you too. But I want my children to actually know and understand the Bible. Throughout the day, I try to just incorporate just Bible statements. You know, just, just saying like, just, you know, making just, you know, uh, 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 just references to the Word of God. Like when, every time when the kids, you know, we're all going outside, we're taking our shoes off. You know, I'll reference, you know, you know put off thy shoes from off thy feet. You know, I'll just make just random statements like that. If they're doing something that I can relate in any way to the Bible, I'll just relate it to the Bible. But even more importantly than that, of just having the oracles of God in your mouth and getting them used to it and loving it, you need to be teaching them lessons and principles. The rules in your house, they should be based upon principles of the Bible. They should be based on principles of the Bible and you should be constantly reminding them of them. You can't be lazy as a parent. You can't be lazy as a parent. You have, to, it's, you have to be on your kids all day long. That doesn't sound fun, does it? No, of course it doesn't. But you have to be on your children all day long, right? You need to be, your kids need attention. Your kids shouldn't be just sent off on their own and just by themselves for a long time. Now, the older they get, obviously, the more that they can do that. But that, does that sound like that's what God intends? He says, when thou sittest in thine house... And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. I found it at the very end. I quoted that. But I was trying to find it while my eyes were going everywhere on the page. So he says, when thou sittest in thine house, he says, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. You're with them. You're teaching them. We need to be invested in our children. And we need to be spending time with our children. And you know, the, har the more children you have, the harder it's going to be. It's going to be more difficult the more kids that you have. But does it sound like, according to this, that, that that's a, you know, a reason to just kind of cast some of them to, side, to the side? Hey, I'm going to invest in. They look like they, you know, have a better, they have superior genes. They have a better chance than the other ones. They're a little bit more smarter than them. Of course not. We need to invest in all of our kids. Every last one of them. It's not, and also, it's not that they get to a certain age and then all of a sudden they're good. You know, like... Like it's the training wheels till they're 12 and then they're on the bicycle and you just let them go. Now they're just all on their own the rest of their life. From 13, 14, they're just kind of doing it all on their own and just occasionally you sit down and talk to them. No, you need to be constantly invested in them. You need to be, you need to be checking on your kids, talking to your kids, you know, interacting with your family in the first place. Your whole family should be interacting constantly and together constantly and, te and talking about the Word of God and teaching them this, the Word of God. This is what our life is supposed to be about. Yeah, it sounds boring to somebody who's not interested in the Bible, who's not interested in serving God, but your life should be about the Word of God. Your life should be based on and predicated upon the Word of the Lord. And you need to make sure that your children have a relationship with God. They need, you need to, it's not only about you. That's what, that's what happens when people are like, what's the most important things in your life? 
You go around and ask any independent Baptist, you know what they're going to say? Soul winning, read my Bible, prayer. You know what they'll do? They'll name a lot of stuff that has to do with them. Do you want something that should be just as important up real super high at the top of the list? Teaching my children the Word of God. Being an instructor to my children in the Word of God. You know, helping my children grow in the Bible and in their Christian life and in their Christian walk. But oftentimes, we're, we're, you know, it comes from this selfish attitude. We're just, we're just you know, consumed with our own self. And hey, yeah, it's important. Your walk is important with God as well, with the Lord. But you know what? Your children's walk is too. And you're the only one that can help them to have that. You know, young, young children. You know, you're the only person that can get them there. They're just with you, especially homeschool, homeschool kids. Who else is going to teach them the Word of God? They're going to be 18 and they're not going to know anything about the Bible. They're not going to have a relationship with God. Do you think there's just 19, they're just going to pick it up immediately? No, of course not. That's not how things work. That's not how children work. They get conditioned. That's why it says, that's why it says train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from you. You need to train him up in the way he should go. It's up to you. You should be training him and teaching him. You should be taking time with him. What do you think about when you think about a trainer? It's somebody that's invested, isn't it? It's somebody who's, who's being paid. It's a professional. It's somebody who's spending time and training their children and teaching their children and instructing their children. You need to take your job as a parent seriously. That's what I'm saying. I mean, look at your household. Everybody would love to have, what, you know, six converts that I have the opportunity just to teach them and they show up every week. I have a better opportunity than that. I have six children that are in my house all the time. Constantly. I'm with them all the time. It's not only Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, and soul winning times. Hey, I'm happy that we're getting new people in the church and they're coming and they're getting interested. They're reading the Bible. But I have, and, and don't let that this, uh, be confusing in your mind. We're, we're downplaying that. I have, though, a better opportunity because I have six, six uh, potential converts, some of them that are already saved, the others that are not to the age yet where they can understand it. And I should take that job seriously because I can make a huge impact on their life. But listen to this, positively or negatively. What do you think the opposite would be true? If you train up a child in the way that he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. What do you think will happen if you train up a child in the way that he should not go? What do you think is going to happen? When he's old, he's not going to depart from it either, is he? You know, there are a few exceptions, but listen to what I'm saying. However you train your child, whatever you teach them to be today, that is what they will be when they get older. Whatever you teach them, whatever becomes a part of their life, if church is a part of their life, They'll go to church when they get older. Hey, there's some exceptions, of course. As I said, the exception proves the rule. If you teach your kids, train your kids to go to church, they'll go to church when they're older. If you train your kids to read their Bible, they'll read your, their Bible when they're older. If you train your kids to pray, they'll do that when they're older too. If you train them to keep the commandments, you, you teach them to love God's Word, they'll do that when they're older. But you know what? If you don't instill that into them and you don't spend enough time training them where it actually becomes who they are, it's not going to happen. It's not going to become a part of them. They're not going to be interested. We need to take our job as a parent seriously. We need to teach them and instruct them and train them. Proverbs chapter number 1 verse number 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. That's how, that's how we should be. This is an example to us. We should speak unto our children and instruct our children and want to teach them, and as it says as well, forsake not the law of thy mother. The things that your mother has taught you, taken you aside. This is both parents, of course. Equally, we need to take this job seriously, this responsibility that has been given to us seriously. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 5. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. So it tells you a fool despise his father's instruction. And you know, one thing too to, 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 to kids, to children that are getting a little bit older, every teenager gets to an age, and I can't remember how the statement goes, so I'm not going to try to quote it about Mark Twain. You know, he has a, a, maybe I will try, it's real interesting, maybe somebody else might know. But he says something about when I was, when I was 18, I noticed, you know, what a fool my father was. And he says, I left for five years and I came back and I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in five years. You know, it's, it's, it's a quote from Mark Twain, which I didn't quote it exactly right. 
But the point is, and those that are adults understood, the point is that he wasn't really a fool. You were the fool. And kids often get this idea in their head. I know I felt this way. Children get this to this point, especially when they start to become a teenager, where they think that they're just, they just know everything. They think that they you know, are the bee's knees. When, you know, they've experienced everything in life. They're so intelligent. They know everything, and they begin to look at their parents when their parents are giving them advice like, you don't know what you're talking about. I know better. Do you know why you think that? Because you're a fool. That's why kids think that. Because you are foolish. It, that is, where is that coming from? That is, it's not just dumb and stupid. That is a part of it, of course. Just like it is a part of every aspect of sinful nature that we have. But it's a part of pride, isn't it? Notice how it's, it's not just foolishness in, in, in the sense of being ignorant. It, it's because pride is there. Pride is bound in their heart. That foolishness that's bound in their heart, it's a sinful foolishness. That's what's in their heart. And all children, they get to an age where they just think they know everything. Do you know why you think you know everything? Because you're a fool. Because you're a fool. Because there's foolishness in your heart. And all kids will get to this point. And they need to, you know what they need to do? They need to go to the Word of God. What's it say? A fool despiseth his father's instruction. It says, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Notice it says the rod and reproof. So spanking, yes, but a reproof. Never spank your children without reproving them. What is reproving? It's verbal correction. It's explaining to them verbally what they did wrong. You always need to take the time and explain to them, and, and, and be diligent. Assure that they understood what you said. Make sure that they understand everything that you're explaining to them and what they did wrong, so that they actually are capable of making, you know, because possibly they're sinning out of ignorance. Like they don't even know exactly what they had done. Take them aside, explain to them exactly what it is every time that you give them a spanking and you punish them. Also, another quick point is that you must be an example of what you are teaching. You must be an example of the things you are teaching. Your children also learn greatly from your example. Your children not only learn from your words, but they learn greatly from your example. You're learning many things from example in your life, obviously. You know, if, there's many ways in which we learn things, and people will talk about, hey, I'm more of a visual learner. You know, that's, it's the same thing, like I learn from an example. You know, we learn in our lives in all areas, no matter if it's something more specific like that, but in all areas, we're learning from example. You know, I guarantee whatever, you know, uh, different areas of your life, and I look at your life and the way you do things, however you operate in your life, your routine or whatever it is, I can trace that back to a physical example that you had somewhere in your life. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. If you're a very organized person, I guarantee that I could find someone in your life where you saw this example every day of them physically doing this, where you watch them physically doing it, and that's where you got that from. If you're a disciplined person, if you got up early, you had this physical example that you saw, a visual example that you saw every day, and that embedded in your mind, and it makes an impression on you. You know, real life, Examples, visual examples are almost just as important as the reproof. They're extremely important. Because oftentimes you can teach your children something until you're blue in the face, but if you aren't actually living it out, if you're doing the exact opposite, there's going to be something lacking there. And it's very likely that maybe when they get older that they just they don't listen to you. They would have to find out the truth in that. You know, it, it, there's a tendency in man also that we will not listen to someone that's a hypocrite. If you see someone, are you, are you oftentimes, you know, would you say that you're oftentimes, you know, likely to follow the, you know, follow a person that tells you to do something but then they don't do it yourself? Of course not. Kids are the same way. We need to have a, our own personal relationship with God, with the Word of God, and our children will be able to see that. Just like when you knock on somebody's door, a salesman comes to your door, let's say. You can tell whether this guy is just sleazy and trying to sell you something he doesn't believe in. You can tell whether he believes in actually what he's talking about. Your kids aren't dumb in the sense that they're not going to be young and immature and ignorant forever. 
They're going to grow up and they're going to be able to tell whether you actually have a relationship with God. Whether you're actually interested and whether you actually believe the words of God. Whether you actually are taking time and care about what the word of God says. And whether you believe in what you're teaching them. They're going to see whether you're actually practicing the things that you're teaching. They're going to be able to tell these things. And that is also going to make an impact on what way they're going to be going in their life. Not only could you be a positive example, but if they, they see the negative example, that's impacting them. So we also need to be a good uh, example visually for them. Visually. Last point, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter number 6. Is that we need to show love to our children. So this, this needs to be balanced. We need to be, I, I believe in having a strict home. And having rules and just not, you know, what you do is if you don't have consistency in disciplining your children, you confuse your children in the sense that they want to get away with it. And if you spank them, you know, one out of three times or half the time, they're going to, they're only, they're, they're, you know, the reason why they would listen to you is because they don't want the spanking. But you know what they'll start doing is they'll start weighing their options. My niece said to my dad one time, my dad witnessed her doing something. She was 16 years old. And she was doing something, and my dad said something to her, Tiffany, I shouldn't be saying her name, I guess, but you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be doing that. You're going to get in trouble. Aren't you afraid? He said, aren't you afraid you're going to get a spanking? And she said, well, I only get a whipping about half the time. That was her response. Why did she say that? She thought, it's worth it. Let's roll my dice, Russian roulette. That's how kids think. The reason why they will listen to you is because they don't want the spanking oftentimes. That's the beginning. And then they start learning and having, growing a good heart where they really want to do what's right. But, you know, for a long time, it's just the spanking. And sometimes it takes longer for some kids to, where, to get that heart right and from actually the teaching of the Word of God. That's an actual foundation where they're rooted and where they actually will keep the Word of God and stay, you know, walking in the, the light of the Lord. But... That, what ha needs to happen for a long time is you just, they just need to be uh, 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 corporally punished, just disciplined with the spanking, just to make sure that they do what's right. Just to make sure that they're doing it. Just, and, and, and yes, it's out of fear. Of course it is. There needs to be fear of, a, of an authority. That needs to be there. We live in this weird world where like, you shouldn't be afraid of you know, any kind of authority. Children, you know, it's terrible if a child you know, fears its parents. What? That's, I don't care about these new age philosophies and stuff. You're an absolute idiot. If you think that a child shouldn't... I had fear of my father and you know what? It stopped me from doing a lot of bad things that I'm sure I would have done. These kids that treat their parents like crap, why do you think it is? Where they're like spitting in their face, they're like pushing them, screaming and yelling at them. You know, why do you think all these other kids are super well behaved? Do you know why? Because they're afraid. Because there's a fear there. It's not like my kids are just like flinching when I'm walking around. My kids love me. They love their mother. But you know what? They're, fra they're afraid that, hey, they know if I get out of line, mommy means business when I break the rules. Mom, you know what they know? My parents aren't a pushover. And the people that, when they're actually that fear is in their heart, they respect you. There's respect. When there's no fear, there's no respect. You know, if you think of even, you know, uh, uh, you know people that, uh, well, I'm, I'll skip that example. I'll skip that example. Look, look with me at Ephesians chapter number 6. The importance of actually loving your children as well. Because this needs to be, obviously it's not all negative. We're just spanking them, always correcting them, you know, yelling at them. And sometimes it's a rebuke, sometimes it's a reproof, just calmly explaining to them. There also needs to be the positive, where your children know that you love them. And you need to be affectionate unto your children. You know, this is something in our day and age and when it comes to, you know, especially as I said, there's a lot of errors, you know, because you can be unbalanced. And independent Baptist, men in independent Baptist churches even, mothers obviously wouldn't lack this as much, where they're not affectionate with their children. The Bible speaks of a lot of affection between the disciples, loving one another, John leaning on his bosom. You know, uh, Judas walks up just casually and kisses Ju Jesus on the cheek. Doesn't that sound kind of odd to you? Why? Because, because our culture is a little bit different, isn't it? You, it, it talks about David and, and uh, uh, Jonathan and the great love that they had with one another. And they hugged each other and wept. 
and, and they kissed each other on the neck. Joseph kissed uh, his father and Jacob kissed him on the neck. You know, the Bible, it, it's a way in which that we show affection. Right? It's a way that we show affection. And if you love your kids, it's good to show affection to your children. It's a good thing. And it's a way to show that you love them. So you need to show your children you love them in many different ways in their life. And obviously you're showing them that you love them in the area of spanking and all of that too and teaching them. But they don't necessarily understand all of that until they get older. But a way to make sure that they do understand that you love them is yes, spank them. Yes, correct them. But make sure that you assure them every time when you do so that I'm doing this to you because I love you. Look at Ephesians chapter number 6, look at verse number 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You need to show love to your kids. You need to bring them up and nurture them. You know, what do you think of when you think of a mother nurturing her child? You think of affection being shown. You think of them loving the child, right? Showing affection. One thing that I do, that I, and I actually incorporate it as like a system that I personally do, every time that I spank my children, every single time, I have an order, of, and there's, it's, you know, there's a three-part system, okay? They come to me, and I explain to them what they did wrong before I spank them. Because I want that in their minds when they receive the spanking. Because I, I don't want them to be doing it. I'm not going to spank them and then explain to them what I did. Or what they did wrong. I'm going to explain to them first what they did wrong. So that at the moment that they receive the correction, the corporal correction or punishment. That they know at that moment that this is the reason why I'm being punished and, then they, and they're thinking in their mind, I'm not going to do that again. So I correct them. And I don't sit there and, and just, just beat them down for 30 minutes to an hour. I just verbally correct them for, you know, at the most five minutes, at the very most. Then I give them a spanking. I spank them on the rear end. And then afterwards, I all, and I'm sure many people in here have seen me do this, I take my children, I give them a hug, I tell them that I love them, and I tell them specifically, and I even ask them the question, Elijah, why do I spank you? And they give me that answer back every single time. Because I want them to understand that I'm not spanking you because I hate you. Because do you think a child actually understands all of it? Did you understand it? Firmly. They may, you know, and so the only way that they're going to understand, if you just yell at your kids and you just give them corporal punishment, but you never assure them that you love them, if you never treat them like you love them, if you're never showing them affection and kissing on them and telling them that you love them and hugging them and spending time with them, where are they, how are they going to understand it? I'm not saying you don't love your kids, but there needs to be a balance there where you are assuring them that you love them. And you know what can happen if it's just beating? Do you know what happens when people get spanked all the time? They get yelled at all the time? Do you know what can happen? They get discouraged. Just like that talked about right there. If they're not receiving the nurture and they're not receiving the admonition, it, it, it develops into discouragement and anger. Colossians, Colossians 3.21, it's just a parallel of what we just read. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. If you're not expressing that you love them when they're receiving the correction and explaining to them why you're doing it, and you should be affectionate and loving with your children a lot anyways, then they're, you know what's very possible? They're just going to become discouraged. They're just going to become discouraged. Nobody wants to, who would want to go to work where you're just being streamed at and yelled at constantly and just, just never anything positive? Nobody. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to go do something like that. No one wants to be around something that's that you know, toxic or hostile of an environment. There needs to be the positive aspect to it, the balance. They need to be, they need to, you need to make sure that your kids understand and know, hey, I'm doing this because I love you. I love you. That's why I'm doing this. It's a, it, you're teaching them doctrine in the first place, too. You're teaching them the Bible. The Bible teaches that. And that's in contradiction to what the world teaches. So you're assuring them up that, hey... You know, if, the, if somebody tries to convince you, you know, that, that I hate you because I'm spanking you, that's wrong. I'm doing this because I love you. And it works. And you'll find out later and you'll understand later in your life that it works. Go to 3 John. We're going to end there. This is the very last verse we're going to turn to. Our desire 
is that our children walk in truth. That's our desire. That's what we want. We want, our, we want to have good children. I want my children to grow up and I want them to be good, godly children that are serving God. And have families. And I want them to teach and to raise their children according to the Word of God. Your children can be a great bless, blessing the Bible teaches, or they can be a great cursing. Your children can bring you shame. Your children can be an embarrassment. They can do things that are embarrassing and shameful unto you. But it's a blessing if your children walk in truth. And they are a good, godly light. And people can look at them and say, man, they have good children. Man, they have good, good kids. But you, know, it's, you know how embarrassing it is? And it automatically reflects back to the parents. Automatically. When a child is just rotten. When a child is just disobedient. When a child is just, you know, in, in just up to their you know, head in sin and just filth and all of this, it's embarrassing to the parent. It, you're ashamed, aren't you? You'd be ashamed if, you're, if your child would do something like that. But it's a great blessing. And this is what we desire for our children. Look at 3 John. 3 John, look at verse number 4. It says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Think about that. He said, I have no greater joy. He's saying there's no greater joy in life. Kids are very, children are very important. Our children, God has entrusted us with our children. You know, God you know, has given us the blessing and has told us, be fruitful and multiply. We ha this is a, it's a blessing to have kids. And when we have our children, we shouldn't just cast them to the wayside. We should invest our time in them. They should be one of the most important things in our life. And we should care about their Christian walk. We should always be making sure and being diligent with our children. And where they are in their Christianity. Where they are in their spiritual walk. Where they are in their character. And all of these different things and different qualities that they have. Care about your children. Invest time into your children. So the points real quickly. And then we'll, be, we'll end. Number one, in order to raise a godly child, you need to spank your children. You need to spank your children. We do so because we love them. It's the only method that works. It's the only method that works. It's a commandment from God. Number two, we, and this is a, a downfall of many people, the principle of understanding that it's all children. Number one, it's all of your children. They all have this. Number, number two, you need to understand that it's not just other people's kids, it's your kids as well. That's a downfall to many people. All children have foolishness in their heart. Number three, even more crucial than spanking is teaching them the Bible. You need to be taking that even more seriously, understanding that they understand and know the Bible, knowing that they understand and know the Bible, be, being sure of that. Reproof is very, very important. And then lastly, be affectionate to your children. Show your children that you love them. Not just all negative. Show them that you love them. Teach them that you love them. Be a good example unto your children. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the great example of being a father. Dear Lord, as you are, uh, we love you so much. We ask you that we would love our children, that we would uh, uh, be great parents, dear Lord, that we would follow the word of God in every area of our life. Uh, we ask you that you would bless us in our parenting, all of the parents that are here today, uh, that we, and you would bless all the children as well and, and guide them, those that are saved with the Holy Spirit into that which is true. Help us to teach our children the word of God. Help us to, to take an interest in our children and to uh, take, set them aside and to be the best parents that we could possibly be. We love you so much and be with us the rest of the day. In Jesus Christ's name.